April 26, 1986, Soviet Union. The most serious nuclear accident of the 20th century strikes the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. After three months, thousands of men have received fatal doses of radiation. To save human lives, a strange automated bulldozer is clearing pieces of radioactive debris from the roof of reactor number three. This remote control science fiction device was designed under urgent conditions. To develop it, Moscow called on the engineers who 15 years earlier had driven the lunar rover on the moon by remote control. The Soviet called their lunar rover the Lunokhod. For many years, its story remained secret. I would say that most people, not just in the United States, but in the world, don't know of the Russian accomplishments on the moon with the automated lunar sample return and the uh, Lunokhods. The Lunokhod, lunar vehicle in Russian, is a child of the 60s, the era when the USSR leaped into the competition with the United States in the race for space. This was a time when communism seemed triumphant, when the first satellite was called Sputnik, and the first man to orbit the Earth was named Gagarin. A period when the first cosmonaut to make a spacewalk was Soviet, when technology was the battleground of the Cold War. On May 25, 1961, President Kennedy told Americans that a U.S. astronaut would walk on the moon before the end of the decade. Nikita Khrushchev immediately took up the challenge. The race for the moon was on. The Kremlin told Sergei Korolev, a survivor of the gulags, to prepare the counterattack. This robust 50-year-old man was none other than the father of the Sputnik program, a scientist and a visionary. The Americans were focusing on a single goal, landing a man on the moon. The Soviets had a secret goal, to send up an automated lunar vehicle device remote controlled from Earth. For Sergei Korolev, this was the first step towards a dream, setting up a permanent base on the moon. The future lunar rover was called Lunokhod. Korolev had to put together a team that could invent and construct this unprecedented device. He contacted the Red Army. The Transmash plant in Leningrad which specialized in the construction of assault tanks, furnished everything he needed, space, technical know-how, and brains. The Transmash engineers were told to design the chassis for the future lunar rover. They participated in the Soviet Union's secret project, the conquest of space a vehicle that could travel over the still unknown surface of the moon, controlled in real time by a driver on Earth. Among these engineers, one man would soon become the soul of the program, Alexander Kamurjan. My father was a tank designer by profession, and he first worked at Transmash as a specialist in heavy tracked vehicles. He was later appointed director of research and design for air cushion crafts. He began to acquire a reputation as someone who could conceive of and create the most unbelievable devices. My father brought together a team for the Lunacod program. For Alexander Kamerjian, the project to construct the Lunacod was not a total shock, because with his capacities and technical expertise, he was a hard man to surprise. Nevertheless, he did look a bit taken aback. For Alexander Kamerjian and his team of engineers, the Lunacod program presented a series of unprecedented problems. How to design a remote-controlled vehicle operated from a distance of some 250,000 miles. How to predict its reactions in an atmosphere with one-sixth the gravitational pull of the Earth. In 1963, 
With computer technology in its infancy, this seemed to be an impossible challenge. Major achievements of the, of the Luna Code program were one, it was extremely early, two, that it did generate some meaningful science, three, that it represented uh, the solution of some difficult engineering and design problems by some very smart people. It's truly amazing. We, as tank designers, were given the mission to construct the Lunacard Lunar Vehicle chassis. Robotics was not yet a well-known science. For Alexander Kamerjan and his engineers at Transmash, everything had to be explored, invented, tested, no idea, even the wildest, was ruled out. These people had designed a whole range of uh, automated rovers for planetary exploration, and they were very clever mechanical designs and testing all of these concepts. The first rover prototype soon rolled out of the workshops. Their designers were the only ones who saw their wheels turn or saw them take their first steps. We were put in a room closed off from prying eyes. This is where we set up our drawing boards. Access to our offices was forbidden. Our work was classified as a military secret. There was never any talk about the Lunar Cod at home. I only learned that my father had worked on the chassis for the lunar vehicle and that he was one of its designers after the device had reached the moon. The Americans were making great progress. After the success of the Mercury and Gemini programs, their astronauts started intensive training. Kennedy on one side, Khrushchev on the other, put heavy pressure on their engineers. The upcoming geopolitical battle would play out in technology and in space. We couldn't let the Americans have the moon. It was the Cold War. But there was a problem. The moon was still a mystery. No one knew what its surface was made of. Was it hard or soft? Would the rover sink into it like quicksand? Faced with this enigma, Sergei Korolyov consulted the best specialist in Soviet science, and then he announced his decision. The surface of the moon is hard. It was not possible to design a remote-controlled lunar vehicle able to travel over a terrain of dust, sand, and rock. We had to find a single option and make a decision. Once this decision was made, we started thinking about the first prototypes. And later, when we saw samples of the lunar surface, we knew that Korolyov's decision was correct. Thanks to Korolyov's bold decision, the Lunacot program could move into the mechanical research phase. Another decision immediately arose. Should the rover have tracks or wheels? Once again, the engineers turned to Korolyov. Korolyov told us, I won't give you any advice. You're the specialist, you figure it out. Alexander Kamerjan and his tank designers initially favored a track drive mechanism. But was this really the right solution? I quickly understood that it would be extremely difficult to use tracks because the electrical energy required to operate the motors was only around 300 watts. Can you imagine? It's the energy of a light bulb. It's very, very weak. The energy of a light bulb was supposed to power the lunar cord under the extreme conditions on the moon. Plus, if the tracks got stuck, it would be the end. With several wheels, it could continue on unimpeded. The Lunokhod chassis took shape under the care of the Leningrad engineers. Here are the rover's wheels, as large as a car's, just under 8 inches wide and 20 inches high. The tread, which had to grip the lunar surface, was a mesh fitted with crampons. And yet another puzzle. 
The vehicle had to weigh under 242 pounds. More discussions, more theories, more tests, and a new discovery with a titanium aluminum alloy classified as military secret. For us, creating a mechanical device that could travel over a specific surface wasn't really a problem. The difficulty was in creating a device that met all the technical requirements. Their mechanical devices were extremely clever, and so they had a much more of a, a classical engineer's approach to it. Try it, build it, see it, test it, doesn't work, try it again, do it this way, and if we only get 75%, that's okay. Next time we'll get 95%, and then the time after that we'll finally have full success. They were much more willing to have a systematic, ongoing approach. In 1964, just two years after the initial sketches, the Transmash engineers were able to test their first prototype. Equipped with four drive wheels, their strange robot turtle took its first ride with a periscope camera. We placed a Japanese video camera on it and controlled the machine from a distance using a television. We then started thinking about the remote control guidance system. The engineers then had to anticipate the rover's reactions on the moon. For this, Transmash created a secret hangar known as the Lunodrome. From a cart, two engineers controlled the second generation prototype on a lunar track riddled with obstacles. The device had eight drive wheels with independent suspension. It only required three to remain operational. Alexander Kamerjan was faced with a new problem, this one purely mechanical. In the atmosphere, when two metal parts are in contact, a film of oxide forms at the friction points, acting as a lubricant. In a vacuum, the two parts would mold together. The answer? They designed a new fluoridated oil, which did not evaporate in a vacuum. The electrical motors were encased in hermetic boxes. But a major step remained, to test these inventions in a gravity-free environment. Sergei Korolev offered to launch a satellite just for us, so that we could test our engine compartments and the mechanics in a gravity-free environment. In the end, we didn't need a specific satellite because we found room in an existing satellite already scheduled to launch. After checking this technical step in space, the Lunacod was ready for full-scale tests. In utmost secrecy, the Transmash engineers transported their prototype to Kamchatka Peninsula, nine time zones away from Leningrad in Moscow. Why wouldn't the volcanic landscape in the far eastern region of Russia be similar to the surface of the moon? This experiment was an opportunity to test the automated control systems for the first time. This penetrometer, for example, which would measure the density of the lunar surface. It was not an absolute replica of the lunar surface. What were important were the characteristics of this surface, its capacity to detect the reactions of the motors and chassis. This surface corresponded to these requirements, and this was the most important thing. In 1965, Sergei Korolyov delegated the entire production of the Lunacod to the Moscow-based Lavashkin Institute which specialized in space probes. Executive director Georgi Babakin supervised the design of the lunar landing module. The Lunacod, a strange rolling tub, was equipped with electronic and scientific equipment. From Moscow, Georgi Babakin could then issue specific instructions concerning the development of the chassis and the autonomy of the motors assembled in Leningrad. Hello. 
Babakin's group sent these instructions. Make sure the lunar cod goes down the ramp to the lunar surface and drives at least a few meters. Everyone will then be grateful to you. But we also knew that if the lunar cod only drove a few dozen meters and stopped, we wouldn't be spared.